name is Amri Salavinaini. I am going to speak about um, interacting photons and phonons in silicon structures. So um, I started at Stanford in September uh, 2014. Uh, we don't really have a lab yet, so we've been spending a lot of time in the clean room. Um, <laughs> and currently we have uh, four graduate students and staff scientist Jeff Hill, who I did my PhD with at Caltech um, with Oscar Painter. And actually, most of the things that I'll present today are um, from the work that I did with um, Oscar. So here's a picture of our lab. Um, under construction, we should be able to get in there uh, early August. Um, so the basic uh, connecting strand in a lot of the work that we do are mechanical resonators and um, <coughs> I think it would be useful to introduce some of the ideas behind why people are interested in mechanical resonators um, to this crowd. Uh, so I'll start off with just uh, a historical overview of mechanical resonators as a technology, then I'll go to their, the integration with photonics, um, some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, results we've had on trying to create uh, a two-dimensional metamaterial for controlling both phonons and photons um, on a chip. And because I don't have any experimental results that are new, um, I'll just go to something completely unrelated um, at the end of the talk. So um, mechanical resonators are a very old technology. Uh, in the 1920s already, in, in Bell Labs, people started to use uh, quartz oscillators. I'll talk briefly about these three technologies that um, I think are important. So the first one is very important. The second one is also important. And the third one is not so important, but it's what I've been working on. So I'll talk about that. Um, so starting with uh, quartz, um, it was realized uh, early in the previous century that um, mechanics can be better than, mechanical waves can, can be better than electrical waves for certain tasks. So mechanical resonators can have higher quality factors. They can be much smaller than electromagnetic resonators because the wavelength of sound is uh, much smaller than the wavelength of light for the same frequency. Uh, they're more reliable and uh, in, also in the sense that they're more um, um, reproducible. So you can make, um, if, you, if you grab a, an inductor out of, the, out of a drawer, it's probably not going to be exactly what it says it is. Um, the tolerances in mechanical, reson in mechanical systems is usually um, better than in electromagnetic systems. Uh, so in the 1920s and 30s, uh, people in Bell Labs, that's when, when the, originally the first patents on delay lines and, and clocks um, were filed, and they started to use these for, for radio systems. And uh, in the one big event was in the 1940s, uh, before the U.S. entered the war, the U.S. Army Signal Corps made the decision that all radio systems would use quartz um, oscillators. And this was probably not a very good decision at the time because they didn't realize that the uh, supply chain that um, was being used to, to make these quartz oscillators was not very reliable. So that involved having people go into mountains and pick up um, little pieces of quartz and uh, shipping them to, to the U.S. And so this uh, led to um, an effort to figure out how to do crystal growth. Uh, and this, so that, that was the seed of the crystal growth effort that later on was very helpful when they were developing semiconductor technologies. And then from the 1950s until today, uh, these quartz oscillators have been widely used. If you break open um, a uh, European PAL standard um, TV set, you'll find something that looks like this inside. So this is a piece of quartz uh, that's been cut in a certain way. Uh, the, the signal that comes in that encodes one line of the um, television signal is, uh, is transduced into acoustic waves that then travel across, bounce a few times, and come out the other end. And this implements a delay line, which is used for error correction. So uh, you, you compare the phase of one line to the phase of the other line, and that allows you to um, correct for the phase offsets. Uh, 
So this is uh, from an uh, East German um, TV set uh, from the 80s. Uh, <laughs> And, and more recently, these quartz oscillators are actually technically the best mechanical resonators that um, you can find. This is from the Tobar Group in University of Western Australia. Um, they show that you can get FQ products on the order of 10 to the, 10 to the 18. So that's quality factors of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 in a 10 to 100 megahertz um, mechanical system. So to, to push the frequencies higher than 100 megahertz, uh, these large quartz mechanical resonators, uh, they didn't really work that well for this because basically you end up having to use very high order overtones because there's many wavelengths that fit into the thickness of the typical resonator. So um, in the 90s, there was another revolution of sorts involving thin film um, acoustic resonator technologies. Uh, these uh, are also called F-bars, um, and they look something like this. There's four of these inside an iPhone, and they're used to um, filter radio signals. So they have resonances from um, anywhere from 1 to 10 gigahertz and, and fairly high Q. They're made out of aluminum nitride, um, so you get a thin film of aluminum nitride, and, and the acoustic field is basically a, a wave that bounces between these two plates. So in the um, early 2000s, Andrew Cleland wrote a paper, a proposal where he said, uh, basically, these are mechanical resonators, but they, they behave as electromagnetic resonators, and we know how to couple qubits to electromagnetic resonators, so let's just couple these to qubits. And a few years later, they had this uh, seminal paper uh, with the Martinez group. Uh, O'Connell was the first author where they showed that they can couple this particular uh, mechanical resonator to a phase qubit and um, bring it down to its ground state, put one phonon in, take one phonon out, and do a lot of the, the typical circuit QED things with, with such a system. Uh, one of the issues with, with these mechanical resonators is that usually they, they use aluminum nitride which, um, as a piezoelectric, or they use other piezoelectrics. These are sputtered films and they're not very high quality. So in this experiment, in this 2010 science paper, their quality factor was something like 260. So you lose one of the, one of the big benefits of um, these uh, mechanical resonators by, by using these sorts of disordered films. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little. And uh, before talking about my favorite system, I'll just talk about how we, we probe these systems. So the, um, the canonical. Um, uh, optomechanical system, which is used to dispersively read mechanical motion, uh, involves uh, a Fabry-Perot resonator uh, with one of the end mirrors that can move. So the optical field, which is um, inside this resonator, probes the motion of the end mirror. And you can describe this uh, with a Hamiltonian that looks something like this. So you have your um, optical cavity frequency, you have your mechanical resonator um, frequency energy here, and there's an interaction between the two where the position x of the mechanical resonator shifts the um, frequency of the optical cavity. You can express this in terms of uh, this Hamiltonian in terms of only rates. So here the rate, the important rate is what we call G0, which is the um, vacuum optomechanical coupling rate. And the interpretation of this uh, rate that I like the most is that it's the jitter on the optical cavity frequency due to the zero point motion of the uh, mechanical resonator. If this jitter is large compared to the optical line width, that's very interesting. Um, unfortunately, none of the experimental systems are even close to that regime, um, but maybe someday. I'm, I'm not going to promise next year we'll do it. Uh, it's been promised before. so. Let's just say that we're working on it. <laughs> um, so the systems that uh, we work on don't look anything like that model. Uh, they, there's, there's these solid state systems, and they involve uh, localized defect states of uh, photons and phonons that are in the same um, uh, location of the, of the structure. 
the, the reason why the co-localization ends up causing the same interaction as, as shown in the um, previous slide is that basically the motion causes uh, in, a change in the index. So you have your mechanical system, you have your mechanical mode that deforms the structure and your, your optical cavity senses that deformation and you can find an expression in an electromagnetic textbook for what the change in an optical cavity frequency is due to uh, local um, perturbation of the index and this expression will look something like this. So you have the um, uh, so you have basically the, the, the change in, in the field, the, the change in the index, this is just first order perturbation theory uh, given uh, the inside the uh, product in the mode that you're interested in. And there's two reasons why locally the index can change. The first is um, due to an actual material property, so the uh, locally the index is related to the stress tensor through an um, elastic optic um, coefficient. And the second reason is due to shifting boundaries. So if, if uh, the boundary that this electromagnetic field senses moves, then where there was no material, there is now material, and there, where there was no where there was no material, there is now material, and there were, where there was material, there is now material. So, so this, this means that locally the index has changed. <laughs> um, and the way that we make these solid state systems, <coughs> uh, we basically use, uh, because we want to have a, um, a single crystal high quality material, we, we use silicon, we use silicon insulator material, which is something that you buy in uh, six or eight inch wafers um, from companies, from a French company that sells it. Um, this is uh, 200 nanometers of silicon on top of uh, a wafer of about half a millimeter of silicon. And there's a layer of oxide, about three microns between them. So we spin uh, resist on top of that. We, we uh, pattern that resist using electron beam lithography. We transfer this pattern into the top silicon layer using an inductively coupled plasma reactive ion etch. And then after some cleaning and uh, under etching, undercutting, we end up um, with a suspended structure, which is uh, connected. It's not actually floating. And this is slightly out of date. This is the uh, process that we use at Caltech. At, at Stanford, we were using a different resist and a different um, etching um, procedure, but we're getting the same results. So if anyone's interested in the fab, you can, we can discuss that offline. Um, so how do photonic crystals work? You've heard a lot about them today, so this is just my interpretation of them. Uh, so if you have a beam of silicon, beam of silicon will guide light through total internal reflection. Light will just bounce back and forth. Um, we want to make a cavity, so we put holes at the two ends of this wafer, and that, that gives rise to standing waves. So you have waves that now bounce back and forth. But this is not a very good cavity, because um, by putting these holes in, we've uh, broken the total internal reflection um, condition and we end up with out-of-plane scattering and also transmission losses because these are, there's no reason why these should be perfect mirrors. Uh, we can make these into perfect mirrors by uh, going to a periodic structure. So uh, a periodic array of holes uh, can give rise to um, a uh, band diagram for photons and there, there will be a, there can be a band gap uh, where um, due to the large index difference between silicon and air and for uh, photons with frequency that are inside this band gap and that are matched to the mode shape of, of, of this um, photonic crystal waveguide, um, they will not be able to propagate in the structure and they will get, they will get reflected. Additionally, the out-of-plane losses um, are gone in this sort of structure, and you can understand that by just thinking that um, each of these scatters the light out of plane, but with the right spacing, that out of, that, the far field um, part of that out-of-plane scattering can be coherently canceled. So with these um, two ingredients, we can make a um, 
defect state that has uh, very little out-of-plane losses and or arbitrarily small out-of-plane losses and no transmission losses. And the way to do that is to um, very slowly modify the properties of the structure along its um, longitudinal axis. And you can think of this as slowly shifting the um, uh, X point in this band diagram into the band gap locally. So, so now um, in the central region, you can have propagating modes, um, but in the outside regions, you can't have any propagating modes. Locally, uh, this is always a photonic crystal, so you don't have any out of plane losses. And um, additionally, out in the mirror regions, you have uh, um, perfect reflection. So that's for photonic crystals, but also creating um, a periodic structure in a dielectric not only gives rise to um, interesting band structures for photons, it also gives rise to interesting band structures for phonons, for the elastic waves that, that propagate in these structures. And um, so here's uh, an example of a um, photonic crystal that also has a localized um, phononic mode. This uh, Phononic crystal has a band structure that looks something like this. So at, at the in the low energy um, limit, there's basically four um, bands of four different types of acoustic waves that can propagate. Um, as we go to um, higher frequencies, uh, the phonons start to see the periodicity of this lattice, and um, you end up getting Bragg reflection, and that gives rise to this band gap. So the, the, diff the black lines all have the same symmetry, and so in, for this particular crystal structure, we have a band gap um, for this symmetry of the um, acoustic mode that we care about. Now the issue is that um, the defect, which is located inside this band gap, uh, that, so that will also have this, this uh, even even symmetry of these um, bands, but in a real structure, you will always have um, uh, perturbations that break symmetry. So you will have coupling to um, these dotted um, bands that are not um, that are propagating that can l uh, lead to uh, loss of energy. So when we uh, make this structure, we typically measure quality factors. Um, on the order of 30,000, and um, simulating the structure with, you know, by hand putting in some perturbations, we can see that uh, there's leakage uh, into the substrate. And assuming a perturbation on the order of a few percent, we can, we can reproduce these quality factors um, on average. So how can we um, get rid of uh, uh, these sorts of uh, losses? One way to do it is to create a, um, a structure that is robust against, uh, more robust against perturbations by, by creating a full phononic band gap. So, in th so here we have uh, a lattice of cross-shaped holes. And if you calculate the 2D band diagrams for the structure, you end up having a region in frequency where there's no propagation of acoustic waves of any um, polarization allowed. Um, one way that I, I like to think of these structures is in terms of two different types of bands. This is an approximate picture, but you can basically um, think of the uh, very low energy um, excitations in this, in this slab that has holes in it. You can think of them as uh, seeing an effective stiffness of the whole structure. And that effective stiffness is um, very closely related to how uh, thin these connecting bridges are. So if I make these bridges very thin, the whole structure becomes very floppy. And that reduces the um, energy of these um, Debye bands, so it causes them to go down. On the other hand, there's other modes, other types of phonons that propagate in the structure, and they come from the sort of tight binding picture. So you have these localized um, mechanical resonances in these and these squares, and they couple to each other through these connectors. So if I make these connectors very thin, uh, the frequency of the modes that are localized in these squares is not going to change. And so these Einstein bands, they don't, their frequency isn't strongly affected by uh, making these connectors small. They'll get flatter, but 
it, it's not going to change their frequency. So, so between these two types of bands, you end up having a, um, a band gap. And uh, in simulations, when we put just a few uh, rows of this type of material around our um, mechanical resonator, that creates a robust improvement in the uh, mechanical quality factor. So without, without this shield, we have uh, in simulation quality factors on the order of tens of thousands to a million, uh, assuming perturbations of um, a few nanometers, which is what we expect from our fabrication. With this shield and assuming the same perturbation, we get about 10 to the 6 improvement in simulation. So in, in actual measurements, uh, we can, we're not really limited by these clamping losses anymore. Uh, when we cool these structures uh, down to uh, dilution first temperatures, we see mechanical quality factors on the order of 10 to 30 million for a uh, 4 gigahertz resonator. So that's, uh, I mean, we haven't done, um, I guess we don't know exactly what the T2 time is, but the, the T1 is greater than a millisecond in these um, structures. Okay, so these compare well to uh, other chip scale mechanical resonators, so they're actually much better than um, any other chip scale technology. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, I think the only mechanical resonators that beat these right now are the other quartz uh, systems at dilution first temperatures. So, a natural question that arises uh, when designing these crystals is, whether we can extend these results to, to 2D. And, and this is a question that you know, came up quite early on in our work. And, and, and the approach was, well, let's, let's try to synthesize the structure starting with the, at, the, at the simplest level. So at, in, with the unit cell that has the highest amount of symmetry and the smallest number of parameters. So to, the, our first requirement was you have to have a full phononic and a full photonic um, band gap. So you can't have a 2D structure that has a partial um, phononic band gap. And the reasoning is, so in, in 1D you can do um, with a partial phononic band gap because disorder will couple, disorder will couple to modes that have other symmetries, but it will only couple, in, in a 1D structure you only couple to basically, you know, two different states for every other symmetry. Um, but in a 2D structure, disorder couples you to a whole circle in, in K space. So you're, um, you really need the robustness that comes from the full phonic band gap if you want to actually measure anything. Um, so if you just make an array of circular holes on silicon, you actually can't on you know the 200 nanometer silicon, uh, you can't get uh, the uh, full phononic band gap, so we came up with this weird shape that we call snowflake. Um, this gives you a full phononic band gap between 8 and 10 gigahertz, and a simultaneous photonic band gap in the um, telecom near infrared regime for, for the thickness of silicon that we're interested in, so um, 200 to 300 nanometer silicon. Uh, the next step is we reduce the symmetry of the structure, and now there's a new parameter. So we reduce the symmetry of the structure by um, making a line defect in this lattice of, of snowflake-shaped holes. And um, the requirement here in the design is that you want to have a good photonic um, a, bank, a good photonic band gap. So you don't want to have any leaky modes above the light line, and you want to have a um, a wide band gap that you can create a deep uh, defect state in. So there's really just one parameter that, that goes into this. Um, and then uh, the, the next step is, okay, let's reduce the symmetry by one more and make a zero dimensional defect. So this is a zero D phonon photon defect. And the main design decision that goes into here is what, what sort of local perturbation do we want? So looking at these bands, uh, we want to have a perturbation that reduces the uh, optical frequency to bring it into the uh, band gap, and we want to have a perturbation that increases 
um, the mechanical frequency and takes it into this band gap. And uh, one perturbation that does this is a reduction in the radius of the snowflakes. So if you have a reduction in radius, you have less air, and so you, you end up having a lower um, optical energy. So that creates the correct type of optical defect state. Um, so this 3% local change in the snowflake radius um, does that. And actually, uh, this, this sort of uh, you know, iterative design uh, led us to a structure that looks like this. Um, okay, nine minutes, got it. <laughs> Um, so, to, to be able to publish something in a paper, you have to simulate the actual modes. Uh, so, this is what the modes look like. Um, but, you know, just from the band diagrams, you can basically predict everything. You can predict the um, coupling rates and the frequencies. And, um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, we, we went and we made this and we tried to measure it. Uh, we have a... Uh, um, our snowflake structure here, we, we bring a um, fiber taper close to it, which for a lot about to, these are not so fancy. These are just uh, about you know one and a half micron, and uh, we kind of just put it on the silicon. Um, so we use a um, a standard ECDL laser from from New Focus uh, to um, probe the structure. So. Uh, we send the light in, we, we put the laser uh, slightly on the red of the uh, optical cavity, then we modulate the laser, we put sidebands on it, and we sweep these sidebands uh, using a, a, the, the output of a VNA, and we look at the uh, transmission of these sidebands by taking the signal that goes through the structure and putting it on a photodetector. So um, the output of the VNA, so this axis is from 0 to 14 gigahertz, uh, it's what the VNA gives us. We see this line shape that looks like that. Uh, this is the optical line shape. It has a um, um, uh, optical line width of, a, of uh, on the order of a gigahertz. And then we see this forest of modes. There's a lot of modes here. And uh, focusing on two of them that are very close to each other, these are what we think are the fundamental modes for this particular structure. Going from one device to another, we see completely different forests of modes, and um, it's, it's hard to predict what's going on from structure to structure. And the reason is um, these mechanical systems are highly um, um, sensitive to any disorder. So this is our mechanical mode. This is what we simulate for an ideal structure. Um, if you remember, this cavity comes from a 3% perturbation in the radius, and if we just assume 2% disorder, these are the different, you know, the, the two best coupled um, mechanical modes um, for um, random perturbations of, of the structure. So basically anything can happen. Um, so to, to extend this work further, we would have to really rethink how we design these structures and try to move into... Um, Try to move away from having a large density of states, try to have uh, very small density of states, and to be able to make more predictable um, responses. So new results, there's no new results at this point that I'm willing to present. Um, <laughs> so instead I'll, I'll talk about something that I think is sort of interesting, it's this effect called um, unconventional anti-bunching, and I just want to say that uh, it's probably completely obvious to some percentage of you and not so obvious. Uh, to the rest. It wasn't obvious to me, so uh, that's why I'd like to talk about it. Also, the things that I'm going to talk about, they're not really publishable, so this is a good forum to <laughs> present them. So, so originally, this uh, un unconventional anti-bunching effect was um, predicted by Savona and, and, and Liu, and uh, basically um, explained thoroughly in, in this paper that came out about a year later. So you have two optical cavities. These are coupled to each other. One of them is very slightly nonlinear, and there's a hopping rate between them, J. And what's surprising is that you can have very strong photon blockade for small values of G. So G on the order of a few percent of the optical line width uh, causes uh, uh, the, your G2 to go to zero. And this effect was explained uh, in this paper by uh, Bamba and Momoglu, Karasoto, and Shuti. 
and they show that uh, there's basically this coherent interference effect that uh, causes a complete depopulation of the two zero state, where two is a number of photons in one cavity and zero is a number of states, number of photons in the other cavity. Um, and this has led to some effort in trying to design um, uh, photonic structures in weakly nonlinear materials, such as silicon, um, that are, are coupled <coughs> in this way. But as a photonics engineer, the um, basic question is, can we get this same cancellation in a much more simple way that doesn't involve having two um, degenerate resonators. And uh, in other words, can, can we uh, get this coherent interference effect using just a, a beam splitter that, or a directional coupler that displaces um, the, the output of our state? And if we can do this, then the nice thing is that we actually now have two knobs here. We have um, the intensity and the phase of the coherent displacement. Uh, so the surprising thing is that this, this simplified system acts uh, just as well as the, this double cavity system. And uh, this is easy enough to understand that I'm just going to present the whole derivation here. Uh, so you, you can uh, write your Hamiltonian for the system. There's, a, there's your cavity, there's a small nonlinearity, and some sort of driving term. And um, this driving term, epsilon, is very small. That's why I call it epsilon. Uh, we can uh, write the state as the sum of the coherent amplitudes and the different um, energy levels, so the C0, C1, C2. And then we can just solve Schrodinger's equation um, perturbatively for, for small epsilon and find what C0, C1, and C2 are. And for that, you get expressions that look like this. So you know, to first order, C0 is just 1 because this is basically always going to be vacuum if this drive is very weak. C1 is something that uh, looks like a, just a cavity response. Um, and then uh, C2 looks like a cavity response squared, but there's this extra nonlinearity which comes from the, the two-photon um, interaction. And then we can just displace uh, this psi by, by alpha, and you get something that looks like this. So if um, uh, basically you, yeah, so, so this is also assuming that alpha is on the same order as epsilon. You can, you, you can show that this is what you get. And uh, the point is that the, the parameter in front of 2, which is the, probability, uh, the amplitude of the two-photon state, uh, can always be made 0 um, for any uh, set of parameters, so any delta, any kappa, as long as g is larger than zero. So you can get perfect anti-bunching in the system um, as long as there is any g, um, which I found a little surprising. But of course there's a huge drawback because there's the issue of the brightness. So as g becomes smaller, canceling this component also starts to cancel that. And in the perfect linear cavity, where g is equal to zero, if you cancel this, you're just removing a coherent state, so you end up with vacuum again. Um, okay, so this has been really nicely explained in a uh, uh, paper by uh, Clerk, uh, by Ash Clerk's group. Um, Lemon is the first author. I really recommend reading this paper. Um, and I think the moral is that basically both intensities and uh, <laughs> correlation functions are important. Um, but it actually, I think, does raise an interesting question, which is, you know, are, is there anything, so, so they, they have a plot in their paper that shows the um, uh, correlation functions for, for in, in different states. So, so for Gaussian states, you can get correlation functions that are zero, um, but for very small intensity. And as you increase the intensity, you will always approach one. Um, but maybe it's still a question of whether there's anything useful in this space um, that's operationally interesting. And I don't know the answer to that. So with that, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and take questions. Questions for Irene? Um, so in the 2D structure, the snowflake that you showed where uh, you were very sensitive to disorder, yeah. uh, was there, I guess, a corresponding increase in the 
quantum mechanical cups and strength, and are those things generally related, or? Um, like, I mean, if you want to see this resonator move a little bit and have that have a big effect, does that necessarily mean you're also quite sensitive to small motions in terms of where the dielectric boundaries are? Or? No, no, I mean, we're, we're now, we now have designs where you just have a much cleaner um, mechanical spectrum. You only have one mode, and you also have larger coupling. So um, it, this is just this is really a symptom of the way that these cavities were designed, which was limited by our computational abilities at the time. Um, so this is not the only way that you can design a cavity. You can also just start off with some defect and then use a numerical optimization, a genetic algorithm to um, Make it better. Um, the last part of the talk, can I just think of it as an interference effect that removes the nickel uh, part of the way from the galaxy? Yes. So, uh, the, uh, so uh, it has very little to do with interaction. How does interaction come into play with this? Uh, how does the nonlinearity come into play in this kind of uh, thing? Um, so the nonlinearity, I guess, gives you just a little bit of squeezing, um, and then that's enough. So any squeezing is enough. It's mostly squeezing. It's it's this it's, it's, yeah, sure. So can you can you call this photon blockade? I don't know what the is is that. It's not a useful photon blockade. That's a, hey. <laughs> I don't think that one can make a like a C phase gate. Um, they've related so much. But I mean, you have something which is almost a coherent state, and you subtract a, a coherent state from it. What's left is very non classical and maybe can be something interesting and sometimes may might simulate for some of the I'm not but I'm not sure if I understand correctly what it's going on. So I think I mean I think the big problem is that this zero is the state is still mainly zero. Um well that's often the case. <laughs> <laughs> And then you put on a photo detector and you call it a click or a homodyne detector. And, and, and so you'd like to mess around with the quantum statistics and you can subtract off parts of the frequency spectrum. So for example, in this case, you put a coherent state right in the middle of the frequency spectrum or you can subtract off the coherent part. So when you, when you kind of expand your thought processes between zeros and ones to actual you know, what is the frequency content, then th this kind of concept lets you mess around and change the quantum statistics of propagation <coughs> by adding, subtracting, coherent stuff. Is it does not change the degree to which the state is not classical, right? What's that? It does not change the degree to which the state is not classical, right? right. It's not, it's not. It, it remains, yeah. Change it, you cannot improve the degree of quantum correlations by adding Well, yeah, yeah, you can. You can no, if, if you if you subtract it, one photon, right? That that was, yeah. By doing condition and homodyne detection, that degaussifies the state. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it is not. Yeah. But I think you, can, you know, in the abstract theorist view, but in terms of what you measure, yeah. you can rotate yeah. the squeezing yeah. around, yeah. around, and I. I uh, I think you could probably change not, uh, something that wasn't anti-bunch to anti-bunch. So, it actually worked with that nice little paper. Yeah, yeah, I think this paper is really worth reading. Yeah, that's that. It's so that it remains Gaussian. But there's also, so, there's also this thing with less than one. Yeah, but there's an infinity of classical Gaussian states. There's an infinity of non-classical Gaussian states. So your statement is one over that. <laughs> <laughs>
I said it's not useful. <laughs> so, so again, <laughs> my question is these, these non-classical states that are Gaussian, are they good for things that are, I mean, you can always get these very Gaussian easily. states, non-classical Gaussian states are, you know, will make LIGO work. That's great. Yeah, they're very useful. The statement that somehow Gaussian means that they're not worth going to dinner with. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> As a CIA state, for example, I said it's, it's impossible. For quantum logic, you can't do any yeah. universal quantum. Yeah. 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 I'm never happy. <laughs> <laughs> On that sad note, maybe. <laughs> 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 I can't do it again.